every moment of the day, neural messages speed through the nervous system. These messages bring us information about our environment and enable us to respond to it. Thinking and communication are made possible by the synchronization of millions of neural signals. Let's take a look at how the brain and the rest of the nervous system work together to make all this possible. The basic signaling unit of the nervous system is the neuron. Neurons are cells, but unlike other cells in the body, neurons are able to conduct electrochemical signals. Another difference is that neurons are irregular in shape and have a number of extensions. Most neurons have only one axon, an extension that carries messages away from the cell. Although a neuron's body is usually from 5 to 100 micrometers in diameter, axons can range in length from 1 millimeter to as long as 1 meter. On the other side of the neuron cell body are short extensions called dendrites that branch like trees. A single neuron can have anywhere from 1 to 20 dendrites. Each dendrite has many short knobby structures called dendritic spines. These spines greatly increase the surface area that the dendritic tree has for receiving signals from other neurons. A single neuron can be contacted by as many as 10,000 other neurons. Together, a network of billions of these interconnected neurons makes up the complex circuitry that is our nervous system. When receptors in the dendrites are activated, they send tiny electrical currents that combine at the axon hillock. This generates an action potential, an electrical impulse that carries the neural message down the axon. Each axon may have several branches at the end, called axon terminals. Between the tip of an axon terminal and the dendrites of the target neuron, there is a tiny gap called a synapse. It measures from 10 to 20 nanometers across. Neurotransmitters carry chemical messages between neurons. The presynaptic neuron, the one sending a message, releases neurotransmitters across the synapse. After crossing the synapse, each neurotransmitter binds to a particular receptor on the postsynaptic neuron, the one receiving the message. This activates that neuron's receptors, beginning the electrochemical process again. Neurons carry messages to muscle fibers, blood vessels, glands, and other organs. All of this happens very fast, of course. In fact, in one second, nerve impulses can travel up to 120 meters. That's more than the length of an entire football field. The nervous system is divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, which lie within the bones of the skull and vertebral column. The peripheral nervous system includes all the rest of the nervous system. The brain is divided into four major functional areas, the cerebrum, diencephalon, brainstem, and cerebellum. The two halves of the cerebrum, called the cerebral hemispheres, form the largest portion of the brain. They are covered by the cerebral cortex, a dense layer of neurons about three millimeters thick, the gray matter of the brain. Underneath this is the white matter, a much deeper layer of fiber tracks that travel to and from the cortex. In each hemisphere, the cerebral cortex is divided into four lobes. The frontal lobe controls thinking, speech, emotion, and the planning and production of movements. The occipital lobe receives and interprets input from the eyes. Primary auditory input goes to the temporal lobe, which interprets it as sound. The temporal lobe also plays a role in feeling emotion, perceiving form and color, understanding speech, and in the sense of smell. The parietal lobe receives sensory messages from the skin, joints, and muscles, and interprets them as pain, touch, and the position of our arms and legs in space. Auditory and visual inputs are integrated with these messages. Beneath the cerebral hemispheres are the thalamus and the hypothalamus, known together as the diencephalon. 
All inputs from the sense organs, except those associated with smell, synapse on the nuclei in the thalamus, which then relays the information to the cerebral cortex. The functions of the hypothalamus include control of some hormones and integration of the functions of the autonomic nervous system. Below the diencephalon is the brainstem. Areas in the brainstem play a role in many basic functions, including control of breathing in your circulatory system, perception of pain, regulation of body temperature, and the organization of simple movements. Throughout the length of the brainstem is a web-like network of neurons called the reticular formation that relates to cardiovascular and respiratory control, sleep, consciousness, and alertness. Because it controls such critical functions, damage to the brainstem can be fatal. Behind the brainstem is the cerebellum. It performs several critical functions, including coordination of movements, maintenance of posture, and the learning of motor skills. The medulla, which is the lowest part of the brainstem, transitions to the spinal cord through an opening at the base of the skull. The spinal cord is enclosed within the spinal vertebrae. Axons from neurons in the brain travel down the spinal cord and out to their targets through the peripheral nerves. These axons are organized in bundles within fiber pathways called fiber tracks. The nerves that exit the spinal cord are part of the peripheral nervous system, which has two divisions, the somatic nervous system, made up of the motor nerves that activate the skeletal muscles, and the autonomic nervous system, made up of the nerves that regulate the internal organs and glands, the unconscious functions of the body. Commands from the brain travel down the spinal cord and out to muscles and internal organs. Sensory input from the body travels up the spinal cord to the brain. Wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we experience our environment through our senses. Sensation refers to the process of receiving information through the sense organs. These sensory receptors detect physical or chemical stimuli in the environment, both outside and inside the body. Transduction is the process by which physical or chemical stimuli are translated into neural signals by the sensory receptors. These signals are then conducted by nerve cells to the central nervous system. Nerve impulses that reach the brain from virtually all kinds of receptors are identical in nature. They are all electrical signals. The brain can distinguish between different sensations because nerve impulses arrive via different nerve fibers, which then stimulate different centers in the brain. For instance, any nerve impulses that go to the brain from the optic nerve are interpreted as light, and those that arrive via the auditory nerve are perceived as sound. Perception refers to the process in which the cerebral cortex combines, organizes, and interprets sensations. Vision is our dominant sense. Seventy percent of all sensory receptors are found in the eyes, and almost half of the cerebral cortex is involved in vision. The eye contains two kinds of light receptor cells, rods and cones, named for their shapes when seen through a microscope. There are three types of cones, each of which is most sensitive to one of three colors, red, blue, or green. When light enters the eye and activates the cones and rods, they fire action potentials that send nerve impulses through the optic nerve at the back of the eye. These signals travel to the thalamus, where they synapse on neurons there. The visual information is then sent to the cerebral cortex, where it is processed and relayed to the rest of the brain. The many sounds in our environment range from the quiet tick of a clock to the roar of a jet engine. Sound is produced by a vibrating object, like a guitar string. These vibrations create a sound wave that moves through the air, traveling outward from the object. When these waves enter our ears, we perceive them as sound. The human ear is composed of three regions, the outer, middle, and inner ears. 
The outer ear, or pinna, acts as a funnel for conducting air vibrations to the tympanic membrane, or eardrum. The middle ear is a small air-filled space in the skull that contains the ossicles, the three smallest bones in the human body. When vibrations strike the eardrum, the ossicles act as a system of pistons, transmitting the vibrations to a membrane that covers the oval window, which is the opening into the inner ear. The cochlea, which means snail, is a fluid-filled spiral chamber in the inner ear that is about half the size of a garden pea. Running through the center of the cochlea is the organ of corti, which is the actual receptor organ for the sense of hearing. It contains thousands of hair-like structures called cilia. When the oval window membrane vibrates, the vibration travels through the cochlea and moves the cilia. This fires action potentials that send nerve impulses through the auditory nerve to the brain. This auditory information is transmitted to the primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe, then to the secondary auditory cortex, and finally to the higher order auditory cortex. The processing of sounds, ranging from simple tones to more complicated speech perception, becomes increasingly more involved for the brain at each ascending level. Taste and smell are known as the chemical senses because their receptors respond to chemical stimuli. All the other senses respond to physical stimuli. Gustation, the sense of taste, is important because it provides information about the quality of the food we consume. In particular, it helps us determine whether what we put in our mouths could be harmful to us and shouldn't be swallowed. The tongue has folds and bumps on its surface called lingual papillae. These peg-like projections give the tongue a slightly rough feel. The receptor organs for gustation are called taste buds. We each have about 10,000 taste buds, most of which are located in the lingual papillae. A taste bud is actually a cluster of about 100 taste receptor cells. During chewing, water-soluble substances from food dissolve in saliva and enter a taste pore of the cell, which then synapses a nerve fiber at its base, sending taste information to the brain. There are only a few basic tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and a fifth one called umami. Yamami is a Japanese word which means delicious. Yamami is a pleasant taste brought about by amino acids like glutamate that enhance other taste qualities. That's why monosodium glutamate, or MSG, is sometimes used as a food additive. Taste and smell both contribute to our perception of flavor. In fact, smell plays the greater role. Olfaction, the sense of smell, is far more complex than gustation. Most people can detect between 2,000 and 4,000 different odors. Olfactory receptors are located in two small areas, on the roof of each nasal cavity directly below the eyes. Each olfactory neuron has 10 to 20 hair-like structures called cilia, which give the olfactory epithelium more surface area with which to detect smells. Amazingly, the exposed surface area provided by those cilia of the olfactory cells is almost equal to the entire body surface area, about two square meters. The olfactory cilia are typically covered by a coat of mucus. When you inhale a substance in the air that causes an odor, it dissolves in the mucus and binds to receptors on the cilia. Because the olfactory epithelium is in the upper part of the nose, it may not always be in the best place for detecting odors. In a normal relaxed inhalation, only about 2% of the air we breathe is actually carried to these olfactory regions. That's why we sniff when we want to smell something. It draws air upward across the olfactory epithelium. Olfactory nerve fibers pass through openings in the skull and enter a pair of olfactory bulbs beneath the frontal lobes of the brain. There, the nerves connect with neurons called mitral cells and form complex structures called glomeruli. Each glomerulus receives only one type of odor signal. The signals are then sent to two main destinations, 
Some go through the thalamus to the cerebral cortex where smells are consciously interpreted and identified. Olfactory signals are also sent to other regions of the brain, including the limbic system, where the odors may cause specific emotional responses and memories. For example, odors associated with dangerous or unpleasant things, like a skunk, can trigger a fight-or-flight response. People often talk about the five senses, vision, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. But there are several other senses, including temperature, pressure, equilibrium, and pain. Each of these senses has its own receptors, sensory neurons, and neural pathways, which transmit the stimuli to specific targets in the brain. Receptors that are stimulated by touch, pressure, stretch, tension, or vibration are called mechanoreceptors. These include many receptors in the skin, internal organs, joints, and muscles. Hearing receptors are mechanoreceptors. The inner ear also contains receptors for the sense of equilibrium or balance and coordination. Chemoreceptors respond to chemicals in solution. These include taste and smell receptors, as well as receptors that sense changes in the concentration of dissolved substances in the blood. Thermoreceptors are sensitive to temperature changes and react to either heat or cold. The body uses this information to regulate both its surface and core temperatures. The sense of pain has its own set of receptors, nociceptors. About one million motor neurons in the spinal cord control the movements of the muscles in our arms, legs, feet, hands, and trunk. Neurons in the cranial nerve motor nuclei perform a similar function for muscles in the head, neck, face, and eyes. Each motor neuron sends an axon out through the spinal cord to the muscle fibers that it synapses on and activates. The number of muscle fibers a particular motor neuron stimulates depends on how coarse or fine the movements are. The branched endings of a motor neuron may activate as many as a thousand fibers in the large muscles of the thigh and the hip, while another motor neuron may stimulate fewer than 10 fibers, for example in the muscles of the fingers, where more precise movements are required. Most people spend one-third of their lives sleeping. Even though we're not conscious when we sleep, our brains are not inactive. Sleep is an active, highly regulated process. In fact, research suggests that the reason we sleep is to rest and restore the brain, not the body. A fiber system called the Ascending Reticular Activating System, or ARAS, located in the brainstem, causes activation or arousal of the cerebral cortex. When we're awake, ARAS inputs help keep the cerebral cortex continuously active, in part by allowing the thalamus to relay sensory messages to it. When the ARAS is inhibited, transmission of sensory information through the thalamus is inhibited. This produces the reduction in awareness that is typical of sleep. While the posterior hypothalamus is involved in wakefulness, the anterior hypothalamus promotes sleep. When the anterior hypothalamus is electrically stimulated, it induces sleep. The nervous system is a collection of billions of cells that allow us to think, to communicate, and move. It regulates all the systems of our bodies, when we're awake and when we're asleep. Neural messages constantly speeding through our bodies allow us to learn, remember, and feel, and to experience the world around us. <laughs>